Now we're going to be dealing with the issue of the teaching of the apostles. Biblical Christianity is based upon the assumption that Christianity was established by none other than Yeshua, Hamashiach, Baruch Hashem, Jesus the Messiah, and his teachings were carried on, expanded, and applied by his most trusted disciples called the apostles. Thus, biblical Christianity is Christianity as well as apostolic Christianity. Modern liberal theologians are not happy with this scheme. They therefore have attempted to say, particularly by Bousset and Verde in 1912 and then later in 1914, that the Apostle Paul created Christianity out of the Western pagan mystery religion traditions. So that Christianity is really something invented by Paul and it has nothing to do with Jesus. In my book on the Trinity, I really have in my gun sights those liberal theologians who attempt to say Jesus was just a humble Jew, he had nothing to do with Christianity, and Christianity has no relationship to Judaism, but it comes out of Egypt and comes out of Africa, it comes from the paganism of the Roman uh, and the Greco world. Uh, this is refuted in my book on the Trinity. I will not spend much further time except that the theory that what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught are in conflict has never had any facts whatsoever to back it up. It is simply vile and wild speculation of those who desperately want to get away from their own condemnation. We believe as Orthodox Christians that the Apostles' doctrine of what happens to people in the eternal state carries on not only what Jesus taught while he was upon earth, but also what he taught from heaven as the ascended Christ. Biblical and historic Christianity has stated that revelation did not cease when Jesus was crucified on the cross. We know that the Apostle Paul was knocked off his horse by none other than the ascended Christ. And then he tells us that for a period of three years he was in seminary in the Arabian desert where he was personally instructed by Jesus Christ. These were post-resurrection revelations of the teachings of Christ. And Paul emphasizes, no man taught me these things. I received them from Christ himself. And then as you read Peter, you read the book of Revelation of the Apocalypse, you have Christ in heaven as the glorified King of Kings continuing to reveal and expand our understanding of the eternal state. In particular, the book of Revelation was revealed by Christ. It includes dictation to seven churches and then his revelations which he gave to the Apostle John without the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, the New Testament would not be complete. When you compare Genesis and Revelation, you find the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now, given the fact that Christ continued to reveal himself to the apostles and to the writers of the New Testament, this means that we have a right to look at the teachings of the apostles as not simply being the teaching of the apostles, but once again the teaching of Christ that comes to us through the apostles after he was glorified at the right hand of God the Father, the Almighty. Now I want to share with you in the first paragraph a tactic that I have used in my debates with Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, the world tomorrow, open view of God, process theologians, liberal theologians, 
neo-evangelicals, pan-evangelicals, post-evangelicals, etc. Now, I hate to reveal this because this is a technique that has won me every single debate on this issue. And I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. But the reason I got to let that out of the bag is that I got all these young men who were Davids, who need some stones. And this old man has some polished stones that has, I have killed me some Goliaths. And how many young men, I want the young apologists to please stand here because we're going to have to give them praise for it. If you are an apologist, you fight Jehovah's Witnesses. You deal with Muslims and cultists and liberals. Stand up so we see who you are. You're not afraid to defend the faith. United Pentecostals, you got it, you see. You need some stone. Amen. Thank you, brethren. So I decided uh, at the risk of this tape falling into the hands of the enemy, and then they say, oh, that's how Maury does it. But you know, as I've thought it through, I still cannot think of a way they can wiggle out of this. Now, this technique of dealing with this issue is roundabout, and that's why it always takes them by surprise. They're never prepared for this. It's like, you know, in softball and baseball, and you can throw that curve ball that the guy ain't used to, and man, you're going to strike him out. One interesting way to establish the nature and duration of the final punishment awaiting unbelievers is first of all to deal with the issue of the nature and duration of the punishment that is prepared for the devil and his angels. So I usually begin by saying, since we are going to argue about the fate of human beings, let's put that to a side for a moment. And let's deal with the fate of Satanus, Diablo, the devil, and his angels. Let's establish common ground that we can at least agree as to what the apostles and what Jesus taught concerning the fate of Satan and those angels who fell with him in the rebellion against God. See, what I have done is take them off the issue of the fate of man to the fate of Satan and his angels. We've left this to the side. We're going to deal with this first. And every single time they said, okay. <laughs> now the reason that we're going to do this is Matthew 25 and verse 41, which we looked at last week. If you would please turn with me to the teaching of our Lord in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, when he's speaking to the dam and he's giving the most terrible words that human ears will ever hear. And ladies and gentlemen, these are the most terrible words human ears will ever hear. Don't ever think, I want a divorce. I'm pregnant and we're not married. They may be bad, but they're not the most terrible words. I've got cancer. You've got cancer. Those are not the most terrible. You've lost all your money. Nah, that is not the most terrible word. Your kids are drug addicts. I don't care what words you come up with. The following words are the most terrible words that a human being could possibly hear. They are final, irreversible, irrevocable, permanent, without relief, and they last for all eternity. He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, ye cursed ones, into the eternal fire. The Greek says, the fire, the eternal one because it, to make the distinction between the fires of Sheol and Hades, which is only temporary, 
with the final conflagration of fire, the eternal one that takes place after Christ returns and you have his judgment, which of course in verse 31 is what the setup was when Christ comes in his glory and all his angels and sits on his throne judging humanity. He says, ye cursed into the fire, that is the eternal one, which has been prepared for the devil and his angel. This means that humanity is invited to share the same fate in the same place for the same amount of time as the devil and his angels. So instead of arguing about the destiny of lost humanity, let's talk about the devil and his angels. What are we told in the teaching of the apostles concerning the fate of the devil and his angels? And would you please notice it says his angels? I realize there are some Bible teachers who are trying to say the demons are not fallen angels, but they're either the ghosts of lost spirit of people or they're the Nephilim or they're something else. Here we are told, the bottom line, the devil, and guess who fell with him? Angels, and now they are his and not God's. His angels. Well, the intermediate state between when the angels rebelled against God in heaven and were kicked out and the final day of judgment is an issue that is addressed by the authors of the New Testament. Some of these angels, fallen angels, demons, evil spirits, were so powerful, so vicious, so vile, so evil that God in his mercy did not allow them to migrate to the planet Earth. We've got enough trouble with the ones who were here. And when I think that there were those who were so evil that God gave us a break, I would hate to meet those particular beings. They were not allowed to migrate to the Earth or any other planets after they rebelled against God. Instead, we are told by the apostles that they were cast into a special hell of hells called Tartarus, where they are tormented in, quote, pits of darkness, end quote, until the day of judgment. So get the time scope. When they fell into sin and were kicked out of heaven until the day of judgment, some of those fallen angels were allowed to migrate to the planet and they vex us. Others were incarcerated, imprisoned, confined in a concentration camp called Tartarus. Would you please turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. And again, I remind those of you who um, have asked to purchase a copy of Death in the Afterlife where I give you in greater detail uh, this information, quotes from the commentaries, etc. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, for if God did not spare angels. Now the word if, there are different ways in which the conditional is rendered in Greek grammar. This kind of if means since. There's no question that this happened. It's like when the devil said, if thou art the son of God. No, the Greek means since you, if, and I know you are. The same thing here, if, and we know this is true. God did not spare the, the angels when they sinned, but cast them into what? Now, some translations have hell, but if you have like a little letter or number and you go over to the side column, it is Tartarus, not Hades. It is Tartarus. And he cast them 
into Tartarus and committed them. This is the same Greek word that you would use today for someone committed to an insane asylum. It means they're there and they can't get out. They are committed to pits of darkness, abysses of darkness. Well, what are they there for? Reserved for judgment. Now, we are told by the verb. Now, there's a verb. You see where the English says, cast into hell? That's actually one word in the Greek language. It is the verb tartar oses, which is the aorist active participle of tartaro, o, which means to confine someone in Tartarus, which is further described as pits of darkness or of gloom. Tartarus was a word in classical Greek mythology that referred to the subterranean abysses at the center of the planet full of volcanic fires and caves where gods such as the Titans, and if you've never watched any of the old movies where the Titans and the Kraken and uh, all of these ancient uh, pagan deities. The Titans were incarcerated in Tartarus. They were held captive and tormented in a special hell of hells, the deepest hell, the hottest place. In Greek theology and mythology, there wasn't any deeper hell than Tartarus. It was deeper than Hades. It was like going to the basement level where you really get the furnace. Now, they were there until the day of judgment according to mythology. Now, during the period between Malachi and Matthew and then later in the early church, the word Tartarus was picked up by, by, by both Jews and Christians to designate the special prison not where human beings go right now. Remember, we're talking between sin and the resurrection, between sin and the day of judgment, but a special place reserved for the demonic hosts, demons. And this is a reference, we can't go all the way back to Jesus, when the demons would say, have you come to throw us into the abyss before our time? It's talking about the abyss of darkness to Taurus. Now we are told in the intertestamental literature in 1st Enoch chapter 20 and verse 2 that God placed the angel uh, Uriel in charge of keeping the inmates in and keeping them confined and in torment. In 1st uh, Enoch 90 verses 24 through 27 Tartarus is a fiery abyss which awaits sinners and demons. In the Greek apocalypse of Ezra, we read that sinners are reserved in Tartarus as they await a fiery Gehenna. Now I have before me uh, the Greek apocalypse of Ezra. Listen as I read this. And there's a method to my madness. It's simply this. If you were alive in those days, you would have read this. It would color the way you read the Bible. This explains some of the metaphors that we find in the New Testament. The Bible did not drop out of heaven like a banana off a barge. It came in a certain context. Listen to this. And God said, First, I shall cause, by shaking, the fall of four-footed beasts and men. And when you see that brother delivers brother over to death, and children will rise up against parents, and a wife abandon her own husband, and when nation shall rise up against nation in war, then you shall know that the end is near. And then brother will not have mercy upon brother, nor man upon his wife, nor children upon upon parents, nor friends upon friends, nor slave upon master. For the opponent of men, the Antichrist himself, will come up from Tartarus and will show many things to men 
What shall I do to you, Ezra, and will you argue the case with me? And the prophet said, Lord, I shall never cease arguing the case with you. And God said, count the flowers of the earth. If you can count them, you will also be able to argue the case with me. See, see, we humans never get the point. It's fruitless to argue with omniscience. And the prophet said, Lord, I cannot count them. I bear human flesh, but neither will I stop arguing the case with you. I wish, Lord, to see the lower parts of Tartarus. And God said, go down and see. And he gave me Michael and Gabriel and 34 other angels, and I descended 85 steps, and they led me down 500 steps into Tartarus. Now, you've got to visualize this. The only way he could go into Tartarus and come out alive was he had Michael, he had Gabriel, and he had a whole host. Now listen. And I saw a fiery throne and an old man seated on it, and his punishment was merciless. And I said to the angels, Who is this and what was his sin? And they said to me, This is Herod, who was king for a while, and he commanded to kill the infants two years old and under. And I said, Woe upon his soul. And again, they led me down 30 steps, and I saw boiling fires there and a multitude of sinners in them. And I heard their voices, but I did not perceive their forms, and they led me down deeper many steps, which I was unable to count. And I saw an old man there, and 50 axles were revolving around their ears. And I said, who are these and what was their sin? And they said to me, these are the ears droppers, gossipers and slanders. And again, they led me down 500 other steps. This guy going down deep. How many things he's going down? And I saw the unsleeping worm and the fire consuming sinners. And they led me down to the foundation of Apollyon those of you who know the book of Revelation. And there I saw the 12-fold blow of the abyss, and they led me way to the south, and there I saw a man hanging from his eyelids, and the angels were beating him. And I said, Who is this, and what was his sin? And Michael, the archangel, said to me, This man is incestuous, having carried out a small lust. This man was commanded to be hanged. And they led me way to the north, and I saw a man there restrained with iron bars. And I asked, Who is this? And he said to me, This is the one who says, I am the Son of God, and he who made stones, bread, and water wine. And the prophet said, Make known to me what sort of appearance he has, and I will inform the race of men, lest they believe in him. And he said to me, the appearance of his face is as a wild man. His right eye is like a star rising at dawn and the other is unmoving. His mouth is one cubic. His teeth are a span long. His fingers are like scythers. The soles of his feet two span. And on his forehead an inscription, Antichrist. He was exalted up to heaven. He will descend as far as Hades. One time he will be a child and another an old man. And the prophet said, Lord, how do you permit the race of man to stray? And God said, Hear my prophet. He becomes a child and an old man and no one will believe in him, even him that is my beloved son. And after these things a trumpet and the graves will be opened and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Then... The Antichrist, having heard the terrible threat, will hide himself in outer darkness. Then the heaven and the earth and the sea will perish. Then I will burn the heaven for 80 cubics and the earth for 800 cubics. And the prophet said, And in what did the heaven sin? And God said, Since it is evil. And the prophet said, Lord, in what did the earth sin? Since the opponent, Antichrist, having heard my terrible threat, will hide in it. Because of that, I shall melt the earth and with it the rebel race of men. 
How many of you can catch some of the metaphors? Any clicking going on in the little gray cells? As I have examined much of this literature, and I have only given you just a few references, both before the New Testament and after the New Testament, anyone who knows anything about biblical Christianity will immediately think of the fact that the devil was put where? In the abyss. And the day will come when he will be what? Released. And he will do great wickedness. And then will the end come. Uh, Jude, verse 6, the half-brother of Jesus. Jude 6, And the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, we are told by way of the tense of the Greek word that is translated hell, it is a perfect active indicative, and it indicates that these angels are actually being held in detention, like a prisoner is held in a prison. They are there, but they are being punished, and they are in darkness until the day of judgment. Matter of fact, the word that is translated under darkness can be translated the gloom of darkness, gloomy darkness. Now, the Bible is so clear on the nature and duration of the final punishment of the devil. It's not, I mean, right now, how many of you would say that those fallen angels in Tartarus are not having a party? They are, are they in existence? Yes. Did they simply go, and they're out of there? They continue. How many millenniums have they already been there? In torment, in darkness, awaiting the day of judgment. Well, what happens when the day of judgment comes? Oh, well, just turn over to the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 19. Phase one, we are told, when the Antichrist and the false prophet are let loose, they do their dastardly deeds. Verse 20, the beast was seized and with him the false prophet. So you have the Antichrist and the false prophet. They were arrested. The false prophet performed signs in the presence, his present, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two individuals were thrown dead. Alive. alive. They were thrown alive into the lake of fire which continuously burns with sulfur. It is sulfuric fire, one of the hottest fires known to man. I had a chemistry teacher who ignited a petri dish of sulfur and you could feel the flame from the front row where I was. Now we are told that they were thrown alive into this lake of sulfuric fire. Does it say they went and they disappeared? No. Matter of fact, turn to the next chapter. Now we come to the oh no passage that every time in, let's say, a radio debate, when I say let's look at the book of Revelation and look at verse 10, the annihilationist goes, oh no, because they don't want to deal with this verse. Listen to it very carefully. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of sulfuric fire where the beast and the false prophet were. Is that what it says? Are. Are. The grammar cannot be denied. They are still alive 1,000 years later. They have not ceased to exist. Now the three of them, the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet, now they cease to exist. Is that what it says? Listen, they will be tormented, and it's the Greek word for torture people. 
It is the meanest word for torture in the Greek language. It is not a pleasant experience. So what is the nature of their punishment? They will be tormented. What is the duration? Day and night. You mean they don't get to sleep at night? No, honey. Day and night. Well, how long will they be tormented day and night? Five years? Forever. Forever. Well, how long is forever? Ever! You can't get any stronger in the Greek language. There is nothing more you can possibly say in Greek to indicate eternal conscious torture than the words in the original text here in verse 10. That's why they always go, oh no. Do we have to go to this verse? I said, oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's why in Matthew 25, the devil and his angels go into the fire, the eternal one, in verse 41 and verse 46, it's called eternal punishment because the punishment is unending. It, they keep being punished and punished and punished and punished for all eternity. Well, the nature and duration of torment that awaits unbelievers is linked to the fate of the devil and his angels, isn't it? Yeah, Matthew 25 and verse 46. Well, also in 2 Peter chapter 4, verses through 9. I know it's late, but just hold on for a moment. Turn over to 2 Peter now. Now, you can see why in every debate that God has enabled me to have, and there have been many of them. Do you see, beginning with the fate of the devil and his angels, there is no way to wiggle out they face eternal torment in the lake of sulfuric fire. You can't escape it. That's why in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, if, and that means in the sense, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but hurled them into Tartarus, where they are confined to the abysses of darkness awaiting the day of judgment, and he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if, that is, since he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if, that is, since he rescued righteous lot oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. How many Christians can live in San Francisco amazes me. <laughs> now, verse 9. Thus the Lord knows two things. Number one, how to rescue the godly from temptation. That's the first thing he knows. Secondly, to keep the unrighteous, and what are the next two words? Under punishment. Until what? The day of judgment. Now, the grammar is very clear. Very, 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 very clear. He says that when it comes to unbelievers between their death and their day of judgment, they are going to be in the state of perpetual punishment just like the angels in Tartarus are under perpetual punishment. During this intermediate state, we are told that it is appointed unto man once to die and after that judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. We're told not only in verse 9 that the wicked now are under punishment awaiting the day of judgment, which is even going to be worse for them, but we're also told in verse 17 of 2 Peter 2 
Unbelievers are springs without water and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. The Greek is emphatic. They have a reservation. Some of you may have enjoyed my phone calls to hell on the program. I have one I'm working on. The opera says, this is hell. I said, could you give me reservations? Well, I want to see if Clark Pinnock still has his reservation. <laughs> yes, he still has it. And I'm going to list some others. See, I thought so. They still got their place with their name on it down there. Jude, verse 13 and verse 23. Would you please turn there? Jude 13. Unbelievers are wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved for how long? Ever. See, the idea that we just go, that would be nice, wouldn't it? You live a life of wickedness and all you face is, and you're out of here. I say, amen. <laughs> but what if your punishment is forever? Well, then you better think twice about living for the devil. You better think twice about whose side you're on. Verse 23. Verse 22, And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatch, snatching them out of what? That's where people are going. The fire. After the final judgment, as if it isn't bad enough right now in Hades that we are held under punishment. We're in darkness. We're in fire. We're in pain and misery. After the final judgment, when you get your body back so that you will physically feel pain in the very extremities where you had so much sinful pleasure. Men, I will not need to comment the medieval theologians were quite graphic about where some men burned brightest <laughs> and some women burned there too. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9, Jesus Christ will come with flaming fire to take vengeance on anyone who doesn't know God and does not obey the gospel. That's why in Revelation 14, Verses 10 and 11, it's another, oh no. We don't have to go there. Oh, 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 yes. This is a passage that I have seen Clark Pennock and other Nim News wilt. As soon as I bring it up, verse 9, and the other angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tortured with sulfuric fire in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torture goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. We are told that the full execution of the wrath of God is eternal torment in the very presence of the angels and of the Lamb of God. And this torment will go on for eternity and they will never have any rest day and night but will always be exposed to the righteous anger of God. Finally, Revelation chapter 20. And there's no way to overcome that passage. 
I remember Erwin Lutzer, who had read my book, Death in the Afterlife, called me and said he was debating Clark Pinnock on Moody Network. I said, well, let me help you. So we got him ready. And when he confronted Clark Pinnock with this passage, Pinnock said, oh, I won't even attempt to get out of it because you can't. The Greek syntax, the tenses of the verbs, you cannot deny them and do it with any sense of honesty. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one according to his deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There is no way to convolute the teaching of the apostles to mean that they did not teach eternal conscious torment after the day of judgment. They taught it. They clearly taught it. And they, following the example of the Savior, warned sinners of the wrath to come. And I leave you with this thought, if these things be so, what kind of gratitude ought we to have? Bob Morey deserves to burn. There's nothing good in me. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's where I belong. I belong in the pit, the abyss. I, I, I deserve eternal torment of the damned. But God in his mercy saved me. And I know it had nothing to do with me. Even as the prodigal son said, I am not worthy. There was nothing good in me that God thought I was such hot stuff he plucked me from the flames. I am saved for his glory and to bring him honor and praise. And then secondly, I need to evangelize the lost. You got a mom or dad who don't know the Savior? A brother or sister? You got friends at work you've never said anything to? Shame on you. You don't push it. Don't be crude. Use tact. You say, Lord, open up the opportunity to slip them the gospel, which is the good news, you don't have to go to hell. See, if you deny hell, you ain't got no more good news. The good news is that you ain't going to experience the bad news. That's the good news. If you deny hell, what's good news about the gospel? So, same old, same old. What matter of men and women ought we to be? in view of these things. <laughs>